Welcome back everyone to Tierno, the brave new world with of course the Kotaku update, but you've already known that for a while by now. Welcome to episode 12 in which we're playing as Leonid Kantorovich, who's leading the Democratic Socialists, or the DSPR, to victory, of course, well, um, in the presidential election for, for the Russian Federation. We got to begin about talking about his presidency. While well, Vasily Shukshin may have taken the first steps in defeating the reactionary parasites, the leech off a great mother lamb. It's become painfully clear that he has no intention of finishing the job. Enter President Leonid Kantorovich, democratic socialist and emancipator of the Russian people. Though Kantorovich may not contain the revolutionary fervor of Lenin or Marx, he has sworn himself to the cause of furthering the wealth for the Russian common people. Opposed by the capitalists Johnson one end and the militarist Cox on the other, the role will not be easy. But if there's any party that can pull it off in the earnest, the DSPR is one. Wrath. Loyalty and influence on fantasies decrease. Gains industrial independence. Oh, wow. Sloth. Rich facilities and academic base gets better. Greed. Poverty begins to worsen. Ooh. Decrease. Oh, that's a decrease. We'll spend a crap ton of money. Carrying the beast. I don't get more taxes. Uh, which one do we want to do first? I didn't increase his decrease. More research speed. Uh, knowledge unchained. Soil away the fat. Well, poverty gets even worse. Inflation will decrease, growth will decrease, well, increase, so I'll get to go with wrath. For as long as humans have existed on the earth, we have fought with rocks and spears, with bows, bows, bows and muskets, to planes and machine guns. We have always forged new weapons of war to kill each other with. Phoenix is the bloodstained symbol of this unfortunate fact. They are the arbiters of wrath. While titans of brains beyond the Federation's military complex, Phoenix are the muscles. Public got hundreds of the tanks, missiles, and planes, and thousands of plants across the Russian territories. If we put an end to their monopoly on arms production, we must cut the blood that flows through it. It's veins. Money. They have the support of not only hundreds of shareholders, oh look at that crap, but their own government. For decades they've received billions of funding to keep a war machine flowing. President Kantorovich and the DSPR proposed drastic cuts to the military budget in order to redirect these funds to the mushroom to the civilian sector. While some currently serving the army and are approved of this, it is a necessary step in order to achieve a truly equal Russia. A simple equation. My way of thinking is quite simple. The newly inaugurated President Kantorovich took a drag of a cigarette as a TV camera straight on it, trained on it. Uh, society can be optimized, law can be optimized, human well-being can be maximized quite simply too. He waved the cigarette All right, at the audience, sending ash flying onto the coffee stained studio carpet. We're not so different than the Russians. We want good laws, families to care for, and the ability to care for them. A job that gives us dignity and honest labor. Democracy so that we can have a say in how our countries run. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm not a radical. I've always deplored violence and the revolutionary rhetoric employed by extremists on both sides of the political ch chasm. But I simply see no reason not to extend democracy to the workplace. Lev Ibramovich, the host, was a middle-aged man in a cheap suit. He narrowed his eyes. President Kantorovich, I fail to see how this is anything but other than a return to Bukharanism. You may have won the popular vote, but your economic policy strikes me as simply disastrous. Kantorovich cleared his throat. You made quite an elementary mistake, my friend, he said. Allow me to simplify. When we speak of socialism, we mean something very different than the Bolshevik perception of the economy. Our proposal is to strive for socialization, not nationalization. He took a brief puff of his cigarette. Under Bukharan, the industry was nationalized. It was owned and operated by the government for the people, government's profit. Our economic policy is socialization, which is to say that businesses should be owned by those who work in them and operated for their profit. The data we've uncovered from early experiments are clear. Eliminating exploitative business owners, devolving democracy to the local level, improving education, health care, and security, these are the keys to the better life. It will help Russia grasp them, the root of all evil. Without the history of man, there's been no greater enemy to the advancement of humanity than greed, sloth, and wrath. While the executives and shareholders of Sibir, Titan, and Phoenix may rest comfortably now, the working peoples of Russia will take the battle to their cozy office and topple the ivory towers built upon the suffering of the common man once and for all. Where the Narnux of the old failed, Kantorovich and Grigorinko will finish what they started, Russia. Uh, I'm sitting integrate a lot of places. Uh, we're currently down here as well. Um, uh, oh, whoops, my bad. Uh, also, I did make sure the borders are kind of nice over here. And yeah, we're going in. Too bad that those guys are really freaking fast. Holy crap. Um, Project Millennia, of course, like we saw in the last episode. And of course, we're still just coring more stuff, anyways, because that's just us. That's it's not great, but at this point, it doesn't really matter. I don't want the poverty rate to get worse, though. I really don't. I really don't. What? what? Why did you go up there and come down here? What the heck, guys? What the heck? Um, do we have planes? Yes, we do. Oh, peace conference is over. Good. Are we still not? Oh, what? We're still war with them. So, yeah. Go ahead and go on in. Everyone should still be in the war, right? Don't think we core all this stuff. It's weird owning that we own this stuff, but whatever. Um, in the meantime, occupied territories, local autonomy is still very good, and well, is this addition by subtraction? There must be a way to make an objective assessment of President Kantorovich. So it's a matter to mathematically determine which of the beasts to slay. I'm afraid not, Leon. That. 
Piyush. It's kind of part of the Duma said, there's simply too many factors uh, to make a genuine objective. Decision for better or for worse. Well, the trust or intuition. Gathrova shook his head. How frustrating, he sighed. Rolling his eyes. Very well. I won't allow us to fall victim to decision paralysis. Lay out the choice. Uh, Piyushish. Place two manila folders on the table. Since Titan is the least politically active mecha corporation, the parties decided against breaking up the monopoly first. That leaves Sabir and Phoenix to choose from. Sabir is perhaps the most dangerous of the mecha corporations, as it control the banks of the most ability to heavily finance right wing opposition efforts, and most likely to become a focus of the bourgeois class dominance efforts. Since they essentially monopolize their food supply, if the turner gets a government, the results could be messy. But beyond that, the rumors of a relationship with Vasily Shukshin has decayed to the point that the RAPP and their officials are privately feuding. The other options are target Phoenix for dismantling. They're known to openly support the ARPP and the numerous minor right wing parties, including some we consider to be neo fascist, not to mention dozens of private union busters. Piyush opened the folder and turned, on to, turned to the third page. But more importantly, we have evidence that Phoenix is trying to support, find support for a series of international interventions designed to lower trade barriers and allow them to exploit workers in China, the Balkans, and smaller countries. If you didn't have to dismantle them now, a different party will eventually seize the presidency and certainly use their leverage to, to begin an endless series of imperialist wars. The choice is yours, Mr. President. Given the stranglehold of the country's food supply, we'll move against the beer first. Um, do we have an option here? Do we? Oh, oh my god. What is this? Gain some public opinion influence. Oh. Ghosts of the past. Severe of Phoenix. Um. Target Phoenix. Everything slowly gets worse. For that. Okay, a sponsor of the Patriots party. That's nice. A severe public opinion influence is below. That's nice. But they won't do. Utterly enable to spend on severe. That's nice. Titan. And then Phoenix. I want to do severe first, maybe. Let's do severe. I want poverty. I want to target that first. Ghost of the past. Petro Grigorinko, the former general, sat as he leaned against the Daka's window. It was raining outside a gentle patter that slapped against the, uh, the glass, beating together before driving to the dirt below. Uh, gray clouds obscured the sun. He hadn't always felt this way alone, useless, simply sitting around waiting for the hours to pass so he could sleep again. There were a time when he fought for something, where he'd been able to hold his ideas and done what he could to make Russia a better place. When the WR WWRF collapsed and the collaborators in the area between Orekov and Samara, he stayed with the Bosnesensky's coming to declare independence. He and General Olsen. Hopeless and did what they could to transform the meager militias into a real fighting force, something at least able to fend off the bandits and the reactionaries to the south, but even then, Kong was rotting. General Grigorenko hadn't had much of a choice of sides back in the day. Zeslav and his maniacs were a fanatic, murdering people at the slightest provocation and turning the neighborhoods they controlled into surveillance states. And then there was Bukharina, who was so desperate for socialism that she forced it down the working class's throat, and Zidanev, Zidanev's theories, once you actually dug into them, were beyond the pale. Insanity, nothing less. So we thrown in with the Komi Social Democrats, but they were almost no better committed to democracy, yes? but sacrificing socialism for the sake of a petty alliance of the capital. Less murderous, no less tyrannical. And soon after, they were allowed gangs of fascists to form. Why? Why not eject the Nazi sympathizers and the madmen before they got to the city? The first century came only weeks later, and even then, there were whispers of Vosnesensky's views that Comey were no kinder. So he faded away. Comey fell, and he went into hiding. He stayed there for years, undiscovered, and contented in his misery in the basement. And it was, so it was a great surprise when he received an official letter from President Kantorovich requesting a service as a security minister. So I set aside misery, harder still to hope again. Honeypots. There's nothing quite like the feeling of pretty girl in your bed. God, that's true. Sorry, wifey pop was too busy to work to come back to the nap, preserving Russia for true patriots. That was something true. Somewhat true. He did work a bit, actually, that night, certainly for the last hour, if you understand. Oh, his Katya, a savior from the dull and dreary life with his rotting fat wife and whiny children. She was younger than he had had any before in her 20s and with bouncy hair and... Uh, and Kirby, uh, uh, Leith Bati, late Bati. And how she performed, oh my, like an actress, like everything he'd ever dreamed of. All he had to do was, for her company was to keep up his winning personality and buy her gifts. Expensive gifts, but nothing he couldn't afford with some careful accounting. You had to when your mistress asked for watches, t TVs, new computers from Japan and rings. God, the jewelry this girl asked for, how it masquered his bank account. Her soft voice tickled his ear, so Ivan, you really worked hard on that, didn't you? Want to talk about, uh, talk a bit before going to sleep? Ivan stretched out his arm to hold the small of her back more easily. Of course, my princess, what we'll, do we'll the phone started ringing on a stand. Just as Lucky Von swallowed a curse and grabbed his receiver, now it's the time he spat. Second command screamed over the phone, Sir, you need to get to go now. One of the guys at the news station has figured out what's going on with the funds. We need to do damage control. Crap, I can't even enjoy one darn night. He rolled out of bed and began to put his pants back on. Call your spying guy, your spin guy, our spin guy. Tell him to shut down the news station, call in favors, anything, just my luck on my one day off. A pounding knock couldn't interrupt the politician's whining. Ivan Petrovich Morozov, I know you're in there, working later, or screwing that trollop. Oh god, it was, it was, it was his wife. They rushed to the door, pants still unzipped. Well, let's do it without, you know, screwing up your relationship. Wait, can we choose it again? Huh. 
Go mill. Pretty nice. Oh, we just need to have to make decisions in. So what does this do? Do we have like a modifier here for this? Should we command? No? Okay. Um Oh, what do you guess what I do want to do is to be at first, technically? We're over here already. We don't want money. Oh. Phoenix and the ARPP allies have been exposed. Well I gotta wait. But this one is not bad too. Across all of Phoenix, different locations, a wide variety of government sanctioned military hard works produced every day. Well, this uh, contract has no doubt strengthened our army considerably. Sam will look to other contractors for military's needs. We'll melt away our existing obligations and funding and allow those that cannot simply be slashed expire without renewal. Well, that constant influx of government funding, FedEx will surely be starved of its main source of income and only further increasing their vulnerability to future efforts against them. Roses. Do we have anything else here we really care about? Um, no. Do you know what the artillery does to a house? What a bomb does? Imagine your home where you place your played with your parents, slept with your beloved, ate your meals, gone, annihilated. You hear a whistle and then it's gone, along with your mom and papa. How many of you have such a, such a fatal thing? Have you lost someone you loved? Uh, in the doom of the Krawa son, they all expected experience loss. The Russian anarchy had caused untold devastation, such that everyone in the room had faced something horrible in the 30 continuous years of war and terror. And a real comey. After the Republic fell, I saw a little girl walking in the streets with her little shoes full of mud that kicked her calves. When I went to her, do you know what she told me? She told me that she had no place to go and that she had to go to school so the teachers might give her crackers. Her walk was five miles through the mud and unexploded ordnance that had slaughtered another child the week before. Ambling, lost in the woods, or lost in the world, she trudged on. When she raised her thin arm, I saw the creator at once was a child, can you imagine your daughters or sons at 10 years of age walking like that for some crackers at school? The good soldiers of Russia want to help their fellow citizens from experiencing such terrible loss alone. Let them do so. Let them help the, build the roads and houses to comfort the children who need a place to stay and food in their bellies. Let them build shelters and greeneries once more. Uh, Kantorovich's words flowed out of him, and every dry, even dry academic arguments became their own war of words, or perhaps a war of hammers and plowshares. He raised his hands and dramatically raised up a finger to begin his next point. 1. Our administration calculated the economic and societal benefits of putting soldiers towards infrastructure, what have in the short and long term, and they're overwhelmingly positive. 2. Our military leaders report that we can sustain this without substantially decreasing our combat readiness. We're not pacifists, and 3. We, as a society, must not stand for endless squalor. If we return to a new age, we must build a new Russian, not a new army. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Greed! Whether in food, wealth, or material possessions, the capitalistic leeches that control our banks and run our factories care for nothing more than lining their pockets with pillaged wealth. No more shall we turn a blind eye to the vampires that suck up the blood of our sacred motherland. Severe is the embodiment of greed. Made strong through about to investments and ruthless expansion, the rotten bear continues to nod while little freedoms of the working class can cling on to. With the help of President Kantorovich and the DSPR, we can finally put down this bloated beast before nothing else can resist its hungry, hungry jaws. Slowly lowering them. Oh, we can do more here too. Below 50, 25%. Mm. Sweet opposition. Oh, we do have money? Nice. Mm. Well, it's probably best, honestly, to focus on one, on one at a time, but whatever. Uh, because I do want to do this one, but my bad. Ah, screw it. Boy, away the fat. Phoenix, while being the Federation's foremost defense contractor, is a bloated mess, comprising manufacturing plants spreading from Moscow to Magadan. Uh, the potential spread across the motherland from sea to sea. Must boil away through the fat that stretches Russia's skin through the merciless government trust budding buyouts. No longer will Russia's shield be walled by an oligarchy, olig oligarchy in corporate suits. We'll take action in our own hands whether they like it or not. Ooh. Expansion, exponential growth. Well, I don't like that we can't do anything else. Oh. oh. Well, we just selected. Wait, what? This is bugged. We just selected a corporation. Okay, now we did that one. Now we did this one too. That is okay. Oh, That's weird. Exponential growth. Uh, President uh, Kantorovich stood before the Federation Duma. The lines of a carefully drawn craft of speech ran through his head. As Nicholas sat in on the podium, flaring the white beneath the burning spotlight, he took a deep breath and began to speak. I remember Leningrad, he said, a hush descended on the chamber. I uh, walked the road of life every day, taking the temperature, measuring the thickness of the ice. All to ensure my friends survived the battle. Leonid's voice cracked as his mind conjured up frostbite and pounding artillery fire against us as well. I thought I had good intentions. That I acted selfishly, but when I look, think of the hours I spent in calculation, the days I spent on the ice, I wonder if it was an act of charity or distraction for the hunger. Kantorovich removed his glasses and began to rub his forehead. I'm not the oh, I'm not the only survivor of the siege of Leningrad. There are others who can tell the stories, share the memories better than I, but all of you will tell you the worst part was the hunger. 
stopping yourself from filling your belly so you'd have enough for the day, next day. Hunting rats in the sewers, watching your loved ones grow thin and pale, seeing their hair fall out and their fingernails loosen and crack. No, the bombings were not the worst part. The worst, most scarring members of the town were the starvation. Uh, there are objective reasons to support this bill. The economic benefits are clear, as Mr. P Piyush has informed you. The societal and cultural benefits are calculably significant. I'd like to think of myself as a rational person. Perhaps I've even proved it. But, representatives, when I made the decision to assist in drafting this bill, my thoughts were not a statistics and uh, abstract benefits. They are the siege of Leningrad, the pain I saw etched in the face of toddlers barely able to walk, and how I would do anything to help stop that from happening again. Not up, not to my people, not anywhere. Civilization marches on its belly, exposed to skeletons. Rumors have been spreading around the current cabinet of certain misdeeds occurring within the Phoenix Company headquarters. With the proposed bill to drastically reduce defense spending and countering more backlash than expected, the DSPRs are needed more than a few skeletons lingering around inside the Phoenix Corp Company closet ever to pass the legislation smoothly. A new Hope. If you want to buy New Hope, please go ahead. And we're always beating these people up. I mean, as we should. Don't get me wrong. One and a half is still not enough. Mm, not great. Let's get better. Into the plowshare. It's 7 in the morning. The sun had barely risen as a man woke up from uh, his cramped and scrapped Petrograd apartment, turning on his TV for the morning news as he fixed himself some breakfast. The anchor was jovial. Uh, and as usual, not that he paid much mind. He cracked some eggs into the pan. Yitim was the sound. Oh, the sizzle didn't manage to hide the clear, crisp sounds of a new voice that came from the TV. A DSPR representative. Just to think about all the people living in squalor now after the war. What do they have? Uh, used for bullets now that they've already won. We have. Made our borders secure, of course. Uh, our position is undisputed. To put it simply, this bill helped millions in the West that have been affected by the war as opposed to, what? More guns? I'm sure that'll help with the thousands of souls still sleeping outside the former ruined houses of the, from the war. It's time for the military to hold its guns and, and pick up some hammers. Uh, the anchor cut in, his voice is probably loud as ever. Now I see from what we've heard, it seems the bill's a bit, uh, got a lot of pushback. Uh, uh, from, oh crap, what did I, did I just read? Oh, yeah, that's what I thought. What the heck? Um, pushback from the a RIPP and the ARPP. Uh, former pres even former President Shukshin has voiced his disdain for the bill, calling it extremely unwarranted. What say you? He's our former president for a reason. The DSPR won the elections with an agent at hand, with an agenda at hand. And we'll seem to accomplish it just as Shukshin accomplishes his own goals. The RAPP and, uh, and ARPP can rant all they want, but no one can argue that it's taking own care of our own. And whoever needs to be convicted of that is not a true patriot, in my opinion. The man took a scrambled eggs out of the pan and uh, dug them into his, uh, with his uh, butter bread. The only thing on his mind was the voice of the firm politician dedicated to the betterment of his life. He looked around his apartment and the dusty platter walls were slowly peeling off. This place could use some fixing up. And while well, we waited and got 50 foot power, decreased influence by 7 and a half. Public opinion is increased. Influence is decreased. How are you supposed to... Okay, I'm going to have to use consequence for this. This is a bit ridiculous. This costs way too much political power when you don't get enough. One and a half is not enough, man. We need to destroy all three? Like, bro. And this is not really explained very well. Um, like, this costs way too much for how little you get. But, reflexive reaction. Sasha never been in a protest before. There are rebellions and revolts, sure, and wars to be fought and won in hazes of gunpowder. Something as innocuous as a peaceful protest that never really occurred to him. He didn't really think about politics until recently. With Shukshin's healthcare policies, he no longer worked on his bad legs. Well, his missing legs. He joined the Moscow Veterans Interest Association a few weeks ago and they talked about a bill to defend the military started getting around. Sasha wasn't a raving lunatic, mind you. He didn't like war one bet. He knew the price of battle better than anyone. So he'd seen, uh, seen enough to know this whole pacifism thing went too far. That's how he ended up rolling down the Bolshe Bridge on a Saturday morning. Sasha had never been seen in such a large crowd, crowd in his life. They walked or rolled or ambled on crutches on the bridge. Many were shouting slogans that organized from the MVIA had memorized and distributed from. Megaphones, they shouted, hear our voice, to in our homes, and other national slogans. The roar of the crowd exhilarated Sasha as they echoed it back to him. Once the group reached Zardari Park, the march turned into a rally as several speakers came out against the swords and a plowshare's bill. Apparently, an event in support of the bill was held earlier with middling crowds, but these overflowed out into the surrounding streets. News crews were ambling about, their cameras aimed like weapons at the speakers. An ARPP member stood before the crowd, shouting into a microphone, We will not allow these socialists to ruin Russia. They disarm us, leave us in a ruin. They said that the troops will remain, but where does that money they spend on rebuilding a road in Siberia come from? The weaponry they need to defend us. What's the use in soldiers with no guns? That's how you know it's a conspiracy by these unpatriotic dude communists. From the podium, the sound traveling to large amplifiers, carrying powerfully across the crowd for a while, echoing his fears perfectly. People won't be so easily fooled. Because there's no way you can do this. Yeah, there's really, literally no way you can do this in time to get all this down without enough political power. Because with we still have court stuff, so that's kind of an issue still too. Against the public opinion influence, you just don't get enough political power to fight the influence. So and uh, public opinion, so you, you just don't you get a piece of chance. In the office of Moscow's Kremlin, there was a nondescript conference room with a long mahogany table. This is where Kantorovich and his mistress met to plan, calculate, and theorize. Vibrant, educated political discussions could be heard bouncing off the walls, as the smartest, most socially minded people in Russia charted the nation's course, at least. That was the idea. As of now, all eyes looked worldly at the TV. 
On screen, there were modest crowds, along with people in black hoodies, red flags, blue chair, and other telltale signs of youth and radicalism. It's nothing new. It was strange to even see it on the news. However, immediately the room could tell why it was being shown when they read the bar below it. The leftists pacify, rally uh, behind swords in a plowshare's bill. Kantorovich's minister assigned to the bill, a short and stout man with a keen intellect and powerful speaking voice chewed his nails as they stared at the screen. We are now live with one of the demonstrators, the reporter is now on the screen, in front of a man in the park. Can you see here how he's holding a sign saying give peace a chance? Could you tell us about what that by what you mean? The young demonstrator, a gangly man with long curly hair, reaching down to the back smile, we all, well, well we support world pacifism and peace, it's pretty simple. Now, according to President Kantorovich, the bill would not significantly reduce military spending and would not weaken the military. How do you square that with your pacifist values? Just about the first step, the man shouted. Several of the youths with communists and anarchist paraphernalia walked by. It is a first step towards uh, disarming the country and ending imperialist wars. First, a small reduction, and later everyone, everything else. If that says it all. Back to you, Svetlana. But the put his head into his hands. The equation just got much more complicated. Optics, people, optics. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, book the sleeping bear. Um, oh, let's do po lots of pump lots. If we're going to defeat the Siberian giant with their hearts and minds, we'll beat them back with their own twisted game blackmail. Well, the official story regarding the attempted assassination below of RAPP President Vasilis Yukshin pins the blame on a long, lone, crazed lunatic. Our private investigators have found certain connections between said crazed lunatic and the treacherous ARPP, supported by a mysterious influx of cash directly linked to the severe executives. By reminding certain ARPP officials of their party treacherous activities, we can gain the political support of, the, of those across the aisle while also hanging out, gu hanging guillotine above the heads of the severe, which shall ever, we ever decide to go public with said information. Hound of Zay. Of all the CD jobs I could have gotten, they gave me this one to me. Find out what the old fat cats and the foxy fanics are up to. Find a connection between them and some corruption for the case. And so, who do they send? Vanya? Nadia? No, they send me. Karel Davidovich, a baronov. I do the tough nuts, the dirty case, and the ones that go cold. It was a muggy human night when I went out to the streets of Zaya. That's how it is. Raised really hundreds of miles from Krasnoyarsk to a follow a leader on the Japanese border. A small light flickering on and off drew me in like a moth to a flame towards an old office building. Some accounting from Zaya Accounting Solutions. Okay, it's more like I had the warrant to investigate it for some shady big numbers by me. Out of the corner of my eye, I was going to knock in on the door. I heard a voice inside in hushed tones. My top investigator skills uh, kicked in as I hid behind some bushes, using my keen and trained ear. I listened for their dastardly scheming. I'm telling you, boss, the money's are good. Now when are you going to get your all-patriotic hoosit boys who helped set out with these runs? A slick Jap when he started saying I could tell he was a Jap because he spoke funny. A strong Siberian voice with you with a captor and break accent carried across in the wind. I don't know, how do you, how do I know you ain't shrimping me? What I want from you is an agreement to pay us by the run each night. You you pay, we work. And I'm sure again, it's a bazookas. Uh, deal? Now, luckily, I took some photos of the two. Then I came the next day pretending to be a tax auditor, and they handed me the dummy files, but they forgot to make me hand over the keys. Now, I see the next night, I wait until they all go home, put on my gloves, and run in there to pick up the documents. This place doesn't have any cameras. It's too far out and too risky if we can take these tapes. Just keep me asking some close calls with our alarms later, and now I'm here. And that's how I was daring hero. Got those real documents to you right now. So how did I do it, Chief? He's an idiot, but he gets the job done. Alternative to means. Internal polling suggests that this bill's approval rating of about 24%. It's completely untenable for administration to pursue it at this time. Stop minister decreed in the DSPR conference room. All eyes are to Ken, uh, Kantorovich, whose hands cover his mouth deep in thought. Yeah, that's just true. The bill is unpopular, Kantorovich said, but that's because of propaganda, not the truth. Popularity is fickle. It comes and goes. It can be ignored or distracted. He stood up from his chair. Can I imagine? I do not give up a, major, a major policy plank due to a media frenzy. The TV stations and the radios, they're owned by the mega corporations who are in turn owned by the bourgeois. The class interests are opposed to our own, and as long as they exist, is it private entities, they'll smear us and our goals. Kantorovich removed his cigarette from his coat pocket. We'll slow to the campaign, but not drop it. Move the education funding bill into the spotlight. He flicked open a lighter, and the cigarette flared to life. We see no business that broken the Federation's laws in the past. Direct the Solicitor General to investigate the Phoenix Corporation. We'll scour the bank accounts, the tax returns, custom patrols, all of it. Once we find one error, one misplaced zero, an inflated deduction, then we'll have to unravel the whole rotten string of fraud. A trail of smoke bled from Kantorovich's mouth. While the public is distracted, we'll march with ARPP and pass the bill. By the time the corporate stooges realize what we've done, it'll be old news. Some more forceful means will be needed to balance this equation. And we're plots upon plots upon plots. So. Um, so I read this one earlier, I think, so. Maybe you want to read this one. Oh, did I read this one again? Yeah. Yeah. If we're not going to beat the uh, Tampere and Joe with their hearts and minds, we'll go beat them at their own twisted game, blackmail. But the official story regarding the attempted assassination of the beloved RIPP President Vasily Shukshin plains the blame on the lone crazed lunatic. Private investigators have found certain connections between the said crazed lunatic and the treacherous ARPP, supported mysterious influx of cash direct, directly linked to the severe executives. By reminding certain ARPP officials of the party's treasonous activity, we can gain the political support of those that cross the aisle, while also hanging a guillotine above the head of the spear. All oh, well, shall we ever go to public said information? Also, I do want to let you, I use cons commands. I'm, like I said earlier, there's just nothing you can do. There, there's not enough time to do this, so. Even though this does increase op opinion by 20 and influence by 15, it's just not enough. It's l literally not enough political power to get all that and core everything else too, to get everything done, so. 
it's just not enough. I'm sorry, but oh well. I'm done. Uh, let's think. Uh, with that, we're a little bit encircled right here, which kind of sucks, but we're working on it. Um, go in there. Just, just go, go head on there. You'll be fine. What was this? Go. Oh, we do it again. Good. Decrease opinion, stability, whatever. Whatever. Uh, we have the political power core right now. Um, so, yeah. See, evidence, age, attached. Dear Mr. Kantorovich, you do not know me, nor my dear friend, however. We're sure a common enemy, those who scalp and enslave the Russian people. The enemy history has, as you know it. It also employs a wide variety of tactics, which you will find quite interesting. Below, I've attached several photos, invoices, and community keys. See, attachment A. First, it's a summary of the evidence gathered thus far. You'll find it quite fascinating, to say the least. Attachment A. General timeline. Uh, one, severe cereals and farm supply. CEO, Kira Arsenyev. As ordered by the board of directors to deal with the political opponents after the surprise election of Vasily Shukshin against Alexander Pokrushkin, one month passes. Two, Miss Arsenia begins outreach towards known assassins in the area that can handle high stakes, high value targets. She successfully contracts one Mohamud Barat, a Chechen assassin of high repute. This deal is struck near the end of the month. Three, Mr. Barat waits until the post election motorcade, two months after the election, before striking at 9.41. Mr. Shukshin's motorcade starts 11 minutes late. It passes without incident. <clears throat> 9.55 a.m. Mr. Barat enters an abandoned building top's floor a mile away from the side of the motorcade as late as he can to avoid detection. 10 a.m. Mr. Barat fires upon Mr. Shukshin when he goes away to the crowd, but misses due to sudden wind acceleration and long distance hits his arm. He fires into his bodyguard in the car and totally fires four shots at 10, 10.01. Mr. Barat assembles his weapon and flees. 8. Uh, 10.15. Mr. Barat contacts Ms. Arsenyev about the operation failure, giving her interest in disempowering these individuals. I believe we have a mutual interest. It will be a shame for Ms. Arsenyev and Sabir of these items to get out. The enemy of your enemy, Alexander Pokrushkin. This way, the opposition. While dealing with those serving the capital's elite is not ideal, we are in sore need of allies in high place if we were to force our bills into effect. <coughs> Though many in the ARPP and the Sabir Corporation see us as nothing more than filthy communists, our contacts within the, within the company have eyed out some potentially sympathetic individuals for a cause. Persuade these contacts in deciding with a party of the working class who admittedly dubious legal means, but the ends will probably justify the means. Probably. Probably. Public sleep and bear. Sabir Corporation is a threat not only to the freedoms of the working man, but the entire Russian Federation. Let's make sure people are aware of just how dangerous the threat of the Sabir Air truly is, embellishment or not. In order to set the stage for complete dismantlement of the Sabir, we must convince the public that such drastic action is necessary in the first place, of course. We'll begin a mass campaign initiative to follow this goal. A call to action from the real patriots of Russia to those who work in the mines and factories uh, for its betterment. United in purpose and action, it will take the fight to the capitals just as our forefathers dared too. 28 candles. Baking is hard. That's why Galson was a surprise, not really. When the cake he spent the last few hours making exited the oven as a brick of charcoal. The mistake was elementary. He accidentally bumped the knob on his gas stove as he closed the oven door, increasing the temperature approximately 70 degrees. It's only 70 degrees. The cake was overbaked, hard, burned on the bottom. Ruined. Galson put his head on his hands. Now what the heck am I going to do? He muttered. Then a flash of inspiration. Right at the grocery store, the only moment to spare, Galson spread inside, shoving up past a pair of chatting old women. He ran. Past the registers. Past the butcher's counter until he made his way to the bakery at the back of the store. I need a cake, he slammed his hand on the counter, gasping for breath. I need a cake, please. The young woman man on the counter raised an eyebrow. I'm sorry, did you already have an item on order? That is a list. No anyone now got some pointed at a fresh vanilla cake lying on the counter. What about that one? Cake's already been sold, sir. Crap, he pulled a wad of sweaty bills out of his back pocket. Listen, it's my wife's birthday. I can make it worth your while. I can give you 50. His voice showed off as her expression lay unchanging. 70? She shook her head. 150, please. It's very important. She snatched the bills out of his hand and stuffed them into her purse. Go before I change my mind. Oh, boy. So, I'm not sure how... Oh. Uh, expose the Manchurian operation. Break the trusts. So, I guess. Is that it? Uh, I guess we'll see you after that's all done and take care of, I guess. Fire is getting worse, of course, but you know what else is new. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, not bad. Not great. Yeah, I just. Just a little disappointed that. You just don't need it. You never get a political power. Like, this is too much. 60 days. Doing all this is just its just not enough. To do this, what it needs to get done to get, to get this done. So, I hate using political uh, cons commands, but, you know, sometimes you have to. Silence the opposition. Oh, ashes to ashes. Our biggest ace in the struggle against Phoenix has yet to be played on the field. The connections to the ARPP. It's been discovered that certain high-ranking officials within the party have been involved in a gun smuggling operation uh, that includes the support of several Phoenix executives. Russian-made guns are crossing the northern Manchurian plain or appearing in the hands of partisan forces operating against the sphere. That only does. Uh, this gross ignore the authority of the federal government and involves Russia to accomplish this already been seen as satisfactory conclusion. We'll use this information to launch. <clears throat> 
a coordinated attack on Fenix and his ARPP affiliates, severely hurting their reputation among the public and providing the grounds for full dismemberment and the purpose of trust-busting. Those responsible will be brought to the rightful justice under the lawful eye of the DRS DSPR, putting an end to the gods of war before they can inflict any more harm upon another land. Pass assault. The moral Zod handled his stake, handled his stake as though he were a surgeon operating on his own mother. Uh, Sarah did not glide through the garlic butter uh, bastard fat, slicing an infinitesimally small piece away from the bone. He lifted the portion, and mined the elegant marble like a jeweler, inspecting a fresh-cut diamond, and placed it onto his tongue. Left smiled and swallowed, I love this restaurant. Why don't we come here more often, Leonid uh, Ivanovich? Uh, Plisic, I didn't even touch his lobster. There are more important things in life than needless luxury. Luxury, my friend, this food is not a luxury, it's a necessity. And why not love your necessities? Let's take a small second bite of a steak. I'm glad you come. Although I suspect not for the pleasure of my company. No, I'm afraid not. Piyush folded his hands on the table. Uh, the DSPR doesn't have the votes to pass the bill on our own. We need support from other parties. You want the RAPP support? Have to beat Shukshin? I don't think many of us will be interested in what you have to say. But you should, if only for our friendship. Let pause in the middle of cutting a steak. A pawn mixture of uh, cooked blood and liquid fat pulled on the edge of his knife, dripping onto the porcelain plate. Fine. But only because you joined me for dinner. Passing the bell is in your best interest, Plushin said. You're a rational guy, Lev. That's why you decided to back Shukshin back in the day. Listen, this bill Kantorovich introduced. The gigantic subsidy for independent grocers and small farmers. Take a look at some of the tax incentives we sprinkled in. Uh, come over to our side. Your constituents in Bashkortostan will end this year richer, happier, and fuller than ever. We'll pass one of our pro uh, platform planks. You look like a reasonable guy willing to compromise. Everybody wins. Lev took another bite of the steak. Seems too good to be true. He dabbed his napkin against his lips. I want an extra tax break for farmers in Bashkortostan and Tatarstan. Give me that and you'll have my vote. Deal. Influence. We're doing what we have to. But Ashes, Ashes will be good to do too. And then Carving the Beast. It has been decided with a revision, or a revelation of Sabir's involvement in the attempt to killing uh, the former president and uh, various transactions of funds to the ARPP headquarters. The stock price has free fallen to the lows not seen since the Warlord era. The shareholders have seen the writing of the wall and have given, agreed to sell the shares in a generous government buyout. We'll auction these company assets off at a suspiciously marked down price of promising new firms and startups, and finally put the Siberian bear to rest for good. Influence? I guess we'll lower influence, I guess. Yeah, who needs stability, right? Oh. Action, reaction, and consequence. Seven in the morning, the sun had barely risen as Jan woke up to his cramped and decrepit at Petrograd department, turned on his TV for the morning news, and fixed himself some breakfast. As a new toaster went to work, the TV blared with breaking news. This just in, the newscaster said. We're getting word that Ms. Kira Arsenyev, the CEO of Sibir's third largest subsidiary, is now wanted with a quarter million ruble bounty. This comes after last night's reports of the discovery of a conspiracy to assassinate former President Shukshin after some upset victory against Alexander Pokrishkin. Several years ago, we now live, now live, with the Nova Sibir's head of police. Uh, the scene switched to an official-looking building downtown. A large and serious man facing micro microphones and cameras flashed like a prisoner facing a firing squad. Jan stared as his toast began to burn. We can not say we've taken the majority of the board of directors into custody as suspects in the assassination attempt on the former President Shukshim. We cannot comment on anything else at this time. At the bottom of the screen, a ticker read reports on today's stock prices. The subsidiary itself was down by 20%, the subsidiaries an even greater amount. The market itself was on the verge of crashing. Quick word from the Nova Scotia uh, Police. The newscaster said, and it seems that there will be no bail allowed by the new Solicitor General, who claims there will be no, a significant risk of flight. This just in. President Kantorovich is now holding a press conference on the issue. Let's tune in. Sir, yelled a reporter in the heated press conference room. Kantorovich could hardly be seen amidst the flashing lights and throngs of reporters surrounding this podium. Mr. President, can you comment on the aggressive tactics of your chief pro prosecutor? Kantorovich looked at the camera group to select him. We'll be prosecuting the perpetrators of the crime to the fullest extent of the law. Access Phoenix? No, we're good. Um, hi, Titan. I still Phoenix. Can we do that one? Uh. My bad. We don't need Phoenix. Uh. Okay. Sloth! Time may appear on the outside support for the Federation of Technological Innovation, but appearing inside the corporate office is anything but. With the end of the Second West Russian War and subsequent end of the German hegemony in Europe, new cutting edge weapons are a war no longer needed. As though there's been a drastic fall in profit margins, and inside the company HQ paints a picture of desperation. Despite the fact, however, Titan still frantically clings on to its monopoly on the campus grounds and in academic circles, the vast majority of her bright alumni are sucked into Titan's grasp through promising uh, opportunities and upward mobility. Before we can break them completely, we must take away their only advantage with ruthless aggression before our Federation is nothing more than one giant think tank. How the heck do you get this enabled? Why can't we do this? Because we can't do target them. Why do we still have Phoenix? 
Okay, now we can do this one. Okay. Ah, that doesn't make any sense. I guess we're doing Fenix. Severe next. Yeah, this is this is a little confusing. Maybe I'm just stupid. I don't know. Trust busting. Being a coup wasn't as flashy as being a CEO, but it was a vital position for the company or CEO. Chief Operations Officer, aka the dude who gets things done. When the Phoenix Board of Directors call for profits, they tell the CEO, and when that person came up with a plan, Yosef got it done. That was his job. Whether it was guns into Manchuria or paying the new anchors to consider their spend or even taking out an unwanted pass, he only asked how high to jump. But now, like a roach in the sewer, he hid in a secret compartment beneath one of their bathrooms. It was a lightless chamber, cramped and humid. Boots pounded above all throughout his home, knocking dust into his eyes. Yosef Adamovich, you are under arrest for treason, illegal commerce, conspiracy, and 24 other crimes. Come out before we tear apart the floorboards. Uh, the moron shouted that over and over. Let him try. Who cares about the trespassing suit or some red goons trying to arrest him? He had resources, connections, fan built Russia, gosh darn it. After Bukharin's crap fest of a government, the Reds had to, had to come to take over with more finesse. But it meant the same if they succeeded. The death of the human spirit. They too would fail, just like every other attempt at communism. Yet as the hours passed, the sides turned bleaker, even though those dogs laughed, more of them were out there. Boots reverberated continuously throughout the house. All the newspapers said he was wanted. There was no escape. He was thirsty, hungry, and had to use the bathroom, reduce the misery to the crapping in his little hovel. They would find him like that. He wasn't going to uh, somehow sneak past a continuous watch, make it from Nova to Montreal while evading detection. So he reluctantly he undid the hatch leading up to the spacious area behind the sink of the master bathroom. He stepped out with bleary eyes right into the chain that rattled, echoing like an explosion through the empty house. At a moment passed, a moment passed, and the echoes of the rattle. Then Boots came running, and the officer's face met the tile, to the tile floor. Hey, Joseph uh, Dalmovich, you're under arrest. You have the right to remain silent. You have the right to an attorney. Maybe. Maybe you have the right to an attorney. Sponsor the Patriots party? Man, that's really bad, so. This bus is not bad. 11% is pretty good, though. Um, anything else? Sloth? Screw the think tanks. Well, we cannot outright buy time power anyway. We can certainly put our own word. Military sentiment has drastically fallen since the end of the Second World or Second West Russian War, and we'll use this fact to discredit Titan in the research. After all, why design new tanks or bombs when we can design new state-of-the-art tractors? Military equipment is out of touch with the needs of the modern Russian. We'll make our stance publicly known. Free the universities. Uh, through almost two decades of constant war. Uh, our promising students have been sent to the technological front lines, designing and putting into the production some of the world's most advanced military hardware today. While time may have proved crucial in the defeat of the Reich, their stranglehold over college graduates must come to an end. Instead of contracts and defense, the federal government will issue promising scholarships and other neglected fields of science, making offers simply impossible to refuse for a curious young graduate. Cool. Oh, and happy November. Happy November. And now, seriously, how are you supposed to get all this stuff done by the time, you know, you get to where we're at without cheating? Let's go to think tanks and quiet costs. <coughs> Executive treason. Cool. Prosecute the implicated. Balance Academia, uh, Carbon the Beast. It's been sad. With the revelation of Sabir's involvement in the attempt to kill the former president and the various transactions of funds of the ARPP head party headquarters, the stock price has free fallen to levels. I've already read this one. My bad. My bad. I've read that one. Quiet costs. The morning newspaper just come in and Cora Blin uh, had walked it over to the table in the dining room, mixing up his coffee and beginning the first stages of the morning routine. His thoughts were interrupted. The front page of that paper was something just as unexpected as it was revolting. As he scanned the page, Cora Blin's pupils enlarged with anger and disbelief, and the headlines read, Assembly convenes reveals taxpayer money going to inoperable, low-quality military equipment. Cora Blin practically slammed his cup down on the paper, splashing drops of coffee all over the table in the process. How could his government spend the people's own money on useless weapons of destruction and not on things that obviously needed attention such as healthcare education? Frustrated, he read through the following article, hoping for some form of explanation, though perhaps he could make some sense out of this, and maybe even lessen the sting of betrayal he felt he had been dealt to him by those he should have been able to trust. No such thing could be found. All that a kid read was the DSPR had uncovered the secrets of the former administration, and the action would quickly be taken to redirect funds to more suitable programs. Cora Blaine could only sit back and take in the fact that his betrayal was indeed real. He got up, threw on his coat, and walked outside. He decided not to go to work that day, for he knew that he would have to make some kind of formal protest, and he'd be joined by thousands that day, and half in the back of the common man, of course. Cyphers, huh? Hmm. 
not lost a division yet. Let's go try and get out. What are you doing? Break them out. Spear. They're still here. Carve of the Beast. Balance of Academia. Academic study is far too long. For far too long, I've been purely focused on new ways to kill out humans. Let's go on to continue our scientific circles. We'll balance our studies with new innovations in programming, engineering, and architecture. While depriving time of the new concepts, we deprive them of a potential future profits. A bright mind unchanged. Ludomir had just finished high school and been wanting to go to the local university. It had been a long, hard road that took years, but he had put the work in to submit a very favorable application. As he sat on his bed for a brief rest, he heard a knocking at his door. Curiously, he looked through the people and saw an older, well kept gentleman with an expensive suit on. The only thing he recognized was the university crest. He paused, someone from the university. He scrambled towards the back of his room, quickly throwing his best clothes on and trying to tidy up the house. He stopped through the getting pants on back to the door, nearly falling out as it opened. Uh, scaring his elder, for which Ludomir proposed, he apologized. Ludomir Vitalievich, I presume? The old man spoke softly. Yes, sir, that's my name. Ludomir quickly replied as he strained his tie. The old man began to speak, telling Ludomir about the university and its history. Ludomir quickly grew bored and confused about the old man's impromptu history lesson. It began to zone out from the conversation until four magic words hit him from the man's mouth. You've been accepted into the university, young man, and Ludomir stood, ramrod still, knocked out of stupor, unsure if he had heard that correctly. Then he was handed the scholarship, the paper and ink to consume Ludomir's thoughts. That was when he'd been working towards all those sleepless nights and for his paper. He endlessly thanked and apologized to the old man before wishing him a good day and closing the door. Ludomir couldn't contain his excitement as he yelled out and jumped around his room. He had done it. All these days and months had finally paid off, from the sleepless nights of studying under a dim light to the bright morning when he had struggled to stay awake. He had really done it. The cycle of studying days on at end had eaten away at him, and disbelief he sat down in his assignment and reduced to a prideful smile. A university had avoided the influence of Titan, or better yet, a government sanctioned one. He wouldn't need to worry about anything besides his studies. Dawn turned to morning and Ludomir got ready to walk to the university, his university, upwards and onwards in the pursuit of knowledge. Um. So Sabir should be completely done. After this one, of course. So I'm going to wait to do these ones real quick. Because I don't want to hurt poverty anymore. It's already pretty gosh darn bad. Oh, we lost a division. Oh well, my bad. Where are my divisions at? Like, bro. Where are you at? The Plush Kantorovich Plan. The Plush Kantorovich Plan, otherwise known as the Wage Earner, funds our plan firmly placed the working class control of the economy through peaceful means. In short, uh, our, it's our plan for socialization of the tools of production in Russia. Uh, basic idea is simple. With the right political connections, we will pass a bill that taxes a percentage of the large company revenues and place them into a wage earner fund. The fund will uh, purchase shares from said company and turn them over to the ownership of independent labor unions within decades or give or take a few years. State unions will have enough shares to own the company and claim management for itself. A true socialization of the commanding heights of the economy run for and by the workers. With well, recent chaos in Siberia, we'll execute a test purchase with the newly formed unions. The unions are currently too new to be able to solely manage the funds, nor is the political climate prepared for such a uh, socialistic policy in full. We'll expect with some liberal debt usage. We'll be able to purchase about 20% of open shares on the behalf of the Sibir Industrial Feder uh, Union Federation. With a conglomerate in chaos, this places the SIUF leadership as an influential member on the board, and they will swing votes with now far more distributed share distribution. We believe that the group, or the SIUF, can grow and secure the bargaining units along with a general increase in union density and other organizations for workers in the broader economy and the political situation will begin to change in our favor. Our benchmarks for this are the union density of 40% for a general industrial union organization to be able to lobby for laws. Upon reaching the union density of 60%, we believe the law will be passed if the unions can effectively mobilize. As of now, the water wall unionization of the entire severe conglomerate has single-handedly increased the union density from 7 to 28% and increased to 21%. Future expansion may occur within Titan or Phoenix, should this situation arise. Two fell a tree, one begins with one strong blow. You did that one? Did that one. Target Titan. How much are the academia? Exorbitant uh, spending. Nationalized think tanks. Well, we'll get there next. Uh, knowledge Unchained. Uh, our, ooh, how about this one? Our efforts have been fruitful in stripping Titan of his only ace. No longer are the Federation's fields of study dominated by war and destructive potential. No longer are Russia's colleges chained to the advancement of uh, weapons of killing. We have emancipated our future generations from that fate. Through uh, President Kantorovich and the DSPR's efforts, we have saved academia from the clutches of corporate monopoly. With this crushing blow, Titan will surely fade into uh, irrelevancy and eventually be sold off to the highest bidder. A sad fate, but one that just so happens to align with our static goal. How convenient. A new kind of change. Ah, good, we got rid of them. I didn't mean for us to expand. Oh, we got a huge chunk of China. This is awkward and weird. Kind of like it though. 
As the crowd assembled into the Duma, Zolnok could not help but break a sweat. He knew exactly what would happen once he read the boat boat proposed out loud. It didn't matter if that was a logical thing to do for many people, for there would always be opposition to it, such as the world of politics. Zonov was snapped from his thoughts by the nudging of his fellow Duma member and stood up, coughing as he did so in preparation for the coming jeering. After some deliberations, it came to my attention that the DSPR, that current funding for the various military branches of the Russian Federation, vastly outstrips any of our civilian sectors, most notably education. In light of this, they motion to pass the Reduction Act, a series of enforceable changes to the current aspects of our monetary expenditures that will greatly advance the quality of the everyday citizen, primarily focusing on the improvement of its primary schools around the country. Within moments, members of the RIPP and the ARPP jumped up and formed countering opinions. The occasional mention of coward or pacifist was slipped out, only to be countered by the aggressive responses of the other party officials, calling out the few Duma members who have been suspected of taking bribes directly from FedEx. In the end, a solid majority emerged in support of the bill. After all, most could agree that the, Russian, that the Russians' need for an enlarged military apparatus wasn't present any longer, or that investment into the consumer economy would be the perfect move to gain popular support for the future bills. As of for Zonov, sitting back down in his chair, he is simply grateful that progress has been made once again. One cannot leave in fear in order to make progress. Um, influence, public opinion and influence, so we gotta do that. And now we have to wait. Look how much he goes up by. In 60 days, that's not great, but still. Death. Well, we won. Well, for the most part, our efforts to curb the influence of the corporations have proven successful, yet controversial among the public. The revelation, revelation of the severe plot and the corruption between Phoenix and the treacherous ARPP has, has severely hurt their public opinion, but many on the streets still view them as their benefactors. Uh, with uh, pressing issues, other pressing issues at the forefront of our campaign, we cannot afford to use these smeared attacks forever. The workers and youth of the Federation still need us, and action must be taken before Kantorovich leaves office. I have 78, everybody. To use maximum investment, use minimal investment. Nice. So passes the to the motherland, art of the, art of the deal. Well, they told me our frantically fixed a suit and walked out of the office into the meeting room, where they had visitors. In the meeting room, there sat two mild-mannered young business people with a document, on the other were like fellow executives, disheveled and thinking. Confused about what had happened, uh, he sat down and gave the two. And, uh, and gave and received mild pleasantries from the two young people. So what is the meaning of this? What happened? Vitomir calmly asked. Um, the reply shocked him. They were being offered to be nationalized. Well, offered. In minutes, his hands grew clammy and began to converse with other executives, equally shocked. They would be bought out and officially nationalized in the military research sector. It was great to Vitomir, but something else concerned him. He knew among his executives that a fair share, including him, had many, many skeletons in the closets. Even if they once were got out, his job would be gone and his reputation tarnished. So the group devised a plan, amnesty. He had amnesty as well they could need both from the skeletons in the corporate area. Vitamir, in a mix of anxiety and confidence, Brashi said, We want immunity or amnesty. We'll join the military research programs, but we don't want to go to jail. Capiche? Repair, ex executing a sort of confidence. Vitamir had, had, had since his youth had a quick conversation before agreeing. What used to be a tense environment turned calm for the executives, who thanked the two government officials and filed out of the conference room. Vitamir fixed his figure and shook his hands with them, thanking them for the deal, a mutual transaction, and raised class consciousness. Uh, if there is one barrier that keeps working class from success, it would be corporate greed, but below that would be class consciousness. The struggling people of Europe have been the victims of endless atrocities, exploitation, and enslavement. We must remind them where the root of origin of this issue lies, bourgeoisie imperialism. While Kantorovich has no Lenin remarks, he is the only chance that Russia has in creating a truly equal society. Allowing our populace to realize this is an important first step towards that goal. So we have nothing to do here then. This stuff is all done, and we're not going to do this anymore unless we can increase, uh, improve poverty, which is not going to happen now. Ooh. Economy wise, spend more, and spend less. We can. <coughs> Surplus? 9%. Through our labor. Millions across the Federation and her associates are toil in nigh unbelievable conditions for a measly salary that often times doesn't even cover basic necessities. We must turn engaged to the workers' struggle and provide them with their much owned dues and force unionization. While the corporatists and fragile strongmen may shriek and pound their desks, they cannot stop progress. With the DSPR in power, the cause of democratic socialism, marches on, with or without the bourgeoisie. Increase this business taxes by 10%, we get the uh, event uh, division, and increases the maximum investment in social funding even more. And this will give us way more, a little more political power, even less factory output, so. Uh, so uh, maximum investment in social funding, huh? Inflation is very high. Oh, pressure of the presses. Yeah, why are we so well on that one? We should go to Cat and Yeah. That one's better all, overall to do. Still doing well here. It's going up, which is nice. It's still going down, which is nice, but still. Mr. Galanskov, how are the organizing efforts in the West? President Kantorovich sat behind his desk, a book of poetry in his hands. The sun was setting, and sending amber and peach light streaming through the window behind him. Yuri Galanskov stood before the President's desk, a dour look in his face. President, I think you know why I'm here. Another ridiculous ideological crusade, I'm sure, will spit it out on him all day. Yuri, take a breath. President Kantorovich, when the Narodniks voted to begin our electoral efforts, you told me that you do everything in your power to support the last efforts. 
Since you become into the office, all you've done is give speeches, appear on TV, and draft bills. No executive action, nothing to ameliorate, ameliorate the working class. Material conditions. Kantorovich laid the book down on his desk. Go on. Leonid Vitalievich, which we are an organization for the working class, but we can't make a socialist country without our comrades understanding the nature of the class conflict. Our presidency is limited. Eventually, the ARPP or the RIPP will take control again. Maybe we'll keep some of your welfare programs, but it'll be ground away inch by inch until we're no better off than before. We'll have to use a little time. We have to prepare the working class to struggle against the oppressive class. We have to prepare for a revolution. And that, Kantorovich said, wagging his finger, is precisely why I despise you. He stood from his desk. My first and only priority is improving people's lives. You think Russia needs another revolution? After the nightmare century we've been through, the policies we're putting forth will transform this nation on a fundamental level with none of the bloodshed and misery your plans would have produced. The president looked out throughout the window. We don't need to destroy the bourgeois. Just pacify them. Russia will become a state for the proletariat, and no one will have any idea. I'll get out of my office. Sweat and sorrow. Blood and tears. We have now forgotten the legacy of the Narodniks. Throughout the history of the century, the Soviet Republic and their subsequent dissolution and splinter states. The Narodniks were an influential force of change within Novosibirsk, a state that far before Shukshin came to power. Falcon used all and any means necessary to rid that corporate playground of the resistance. From that point on, uh, Sabir, Tide, and Fenix only continued to exploit those within its touch, and the socialist cause never truly recovered within the Federation. That is until now. The common man is unaware of the suffering. Of the cause will make them aware through the voices of the DSPR. The past flame of the narrow next will be reignited in the power of began posters and socialist textbooks and in our hearts. The biggest voice is out of the ordinary rush, and by, by winning them over with a rhetoric and with a battle for the Federation's future. Force multiplication. The last manager, acne scarred man in his 40s, raised an eyebrow. Uh, I'm sorry, a pink slip wilted in his hands. You want one too? Left straight in his spine. Uh, Vaughn's wife is pregnant. I don't care what the boss says. You can't fire him. Vaughn took a sharp breath. Left, please, it's okay. I tried to say, he said, it's fine. The man took a step forward, stabbed his finger into Left's collarbone. Now get back on the stupid line before I can, can your butt. No, I won't. Left's voice carried through the noisy factory. The men around him put down the tools, watching the manager's face grow red. You don't have the right to do this. We break ourselves for you and treat us like dirt. You see my hands. Left held up his right hand. A third and fourth finger were missing, ripped away at the root years ago. I lost you in this factory and making garbage that no one needs. You push us and push us and you never expect us to push back. But what happens when we do? Lev's line mates limped closer, some bold, some cowering. But it only took a few, act to, a few to act before the entire line crowded around watching, waiting. There were dozens of them, muscular and young, against only a few portly managers, and then only two owners. I'll call the police, the manager shakily yelped. You think they'll make it here in time, Lev asked? Is that a bet you want to make? The group shifted closer, a few tension, broadening their stance. Lev's manager gulped, I suppose I can review the decision. Lev smiled, see that you do that, we'll be down here working. There's great power in a band of working men. Purpose. I didn't fight for this. Yevgeny Vasilev took a gulp of his beer, then placed the glass back on the uh, grease slicked bar. A country run by communists again. We had our chance to break free of the Bolshevs, and what? We just elected them again? What's the point of it all? He slammed his head on the table. Something has to be done. Yevgeny's friend, Daniel, Den took a sharp breath. You know, you scare me when you say some things like that. What am I supposed to do? Let a gang of rootless barbarians show my country part in the name of equality? I won't stand by and do nothing. Yevgeny Dmitrievich, this is how democracy works. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. You compromise, argue, find ways to move forward. Surely don't believe the RIPP will control Russia forever. Maybe I don't want a democracy. Daniel raised an eyebrow. Yevgeny, what are you saying? A government that allows degeneracy and anti Russian thinking to spread is not one worth defending. Yevgeny swallowed the remains of his beard. These cowards are not Russian, they're foreigners. Squatting in the land, we fought to liberate and corrupting a nation to serve their own. That's not what I fought for. I fought for Russia that stood for Russians, blood for Russians, put everything aside except serving Russians. These rooms have no place in our country. He wiped his mouth with the back of his sleeve and then said, and if they won't give me my Russia, I'll take it by force. Sweat and sorrow. Conditions of that our labor our work are, are dreadful. Whether it's inside the confines of a munitions plant, a coal mine, or hospital, our workers have, have and continue to suffer inside the workplace. While a campaign among our workers to fight for their rights through the automatic unionization bill proposed by the DSPR. No strong one occurrence will keep the voices down, their voices down, and they will continue to scream until justice is done in fullness. The rusted elevator creaked and shook as Ilovich descended into the mine's depths. He held firm to the hand railing, wrestling it to only discover a vaulting amount of dust and grime had painted his palm, which he hurriedly wiped off. The final violent uh, shake indicated the elevator had reached its destination, and Ilovich stepped out to the musty cave filled with smoke. He coughed and desperately held a handkerchief to his mouth to clear his lungs of the smog and began to wander through the mine. <coughs> he quickly uh, found the punch clock station and began to inspect the time cards. The sight was revealed it was their reveal was not a pleasant one, as with every card harsher. The harsher hours appeared, none less than twelve a day. He returned them with disdain, marking them on his report. As he continued deeper into the mines, the smell of sweat and taste of coal only grew stronger, making Ilovich nearly gag. Eventually, he reached an active section of the mine where workers sat on a break. They looked nearly dead, and the clothes were falling apart at the seams. Ilovich's coughing alerted them to his presence, though many still uh, on shift barely noticed him as they continued to shatter the cavern's walls. Oh, look at the company man in his fancy little suit. Come to crack the little whip a little harder? One jeer just does join him. Yeah, let you tend to remain formal as a reply. Comrades, please. You needn't worry. Know that I represent your best interests. I've come to your place of work as a representative of the President Kantorovich here too. 
And another minus cup. That's just the same dragon from the suits that own this darn mine. I voted for Kantorovich, and we haven't seen crap, so where the heck are our better hours or more time off or some cleaner air? No one wants to hear excuses. If you want to help us, why don't you pick up a shovel? The mine roared as more continued. Illich resigned his pleas and began to walk off as more insults and taunts followed him. Uh, some spit through dirt as he walked past, while others only stared with empty eyes before returning to their duties. Illich wrote concluding remarks to his report before dusting off suit and hastily returning from the depths. Out of sight and out of eye once more. Cheer to the common man. In a society based on capital, the ruling class will always seek to keep the working class down, while automatic unionization bills receive widespread coverage or support among their laborers. The conservatives across the aisle and even our former allies of the convenience and the RIPP have expressed their views loud and clear. We must make our voter base know that we are the ones uh, that are their silver shield. We are the ones who keep the oppressive fists of corporatism from crushing the rights of our people completely, and they will know it in every session of the Federal Assembly, every fire speech delivered by our far beloved president, and in every flyer posted in the Red Square. That'd be nice not working 12 hour, 10 to 12 hour days. That'd be really nice. I'll okay, get spending more. I don't think we have any more need for the military. Not, no operations underway. Well, it's still a bug, so we're gonna get rid of you Goodbye. Thank you for playing. The cost of efficiency. Kantorovich walked into the factory flanked by two of his bodyguards. It was a grim sight. The workers were currently on break. Most appeared to be fine at first glance, but upon closer ob observation, it became clear that some lacked fingers, hands, even eyes. Some had fresh wounds marked by soil bandages, while others had scarred stumps along missing digits. <coughs> Were these wounds untreated facility, they're far more for minor. Mr. Kantorovich, many of us fear that seeking treatment would cause us not to lose our, lose us to lose our jobs, since it would most likely be un unavailable for days, if not weeks. Even with the health care reforms, we don't get paid for taking the day off. We don't mind not getting paid on days we do not work, but we do not want to risk unemployment simply because we wish to seek treatment. This needs a change facility, I'll look into it. You able to see the doctor, I will do all I can to make it so. Kantorovich ponders who is driven back to his office. The solution was simple. Implement legislation to protect workers' rights against at-will employment, alongside increasing funding for a more robust healthcare system that was more extensive and affordable without a significant compromise on its quality. The main issue, main issue was funding. Sure, the coffers of the Federation were currently rather large, but such a measure was no mere stimulus package. It would require significant political wrangling, and a consistent flow of money to sustain and improve Russia's healthcare infrastructure and enforce any law banning arbitrary firings. It could get deals with the key re representatives and its own bloc. could definitely get the legislation he needed enacted, but the same question he still went unresolved. Who or what would fund this massive expenditure? Perhaps we could raise corporate taxes. They were already quite high, and while Kantorovich didn't particularly feel bad for the corporations, too high and the corporations would simply move, but with some package laws and capital flight, one step at a time, through our teachings. The minds of our youth are a malleable substance, manipulated and molded in the ways of our predecessors. In the past decade, our children have been taught to appreciate the corporations and elite, to live their lives for the sake of the few. As a disgrace, they cannot be allowed to stand. We all forge a curriculum and appreciate the value of individual spirit and labor. The next generation will be made to feel their own worth, whether the suits like it or not. Hey, that's not bad now. Might as well do that, because we can, but... 60% not bad, man. Not bad, even though the party's still getting worse. Um, yeah. I think being democratic socialist, we'd reduce poverty, but whatever. Fruits of generosity. The clouds above grew ever darker, and the company rainfall soon came, but... It wasn't enough to prevent Kantorovich from partaking in his occasional morning walk. If anything, the rhythmic pattern of the rain only served to put his mind at ease in such troubling and stressful times. Man, imagine having a job when you have time to walk. Many things were troubling his mind, each with their own degrees of significance. Could he truly achieve his goals? Would he be the one to pull the power of the corporations? Would he finally deliver prosperity to the people that have lacked any resemblance of such a thing for so long? Lost in thought, Kantorovich turned down yet another street corner, only to be recognized by a pair of his fellow citizens. They rushed over to greet him, wearing smiles brighter than anything Kantorovich had seen since Victory Day. President Kantorovich, I haven't had the honor of meeting you in person, yet I simply must extend my thanks for the recent efforts on healthcare you've made, which brought me and my wife a sense of comfort in these trying times. Kantorovich looked at both of them, displaying a small smile. I appreciate your gratitude, friend. Well, it's nice to at least shake your hand and meet you in person, Mr. President. Thank you for everything. The couple proceeded to walk past him, leaving Kantorovich alone once more in silence and contemplation. Now thoughts of doubt were replaced by the ones of ambition. I wonder how many people he would help, and how about how many others who have already been. Now the road ahead didn't seem as long, and the dream he shared with so many others seemed just a bit more achievable. A large, grew, a large grin grew on the president's face as he turned around and headed back to the Kremlin and to the tent of eye. It seemed as though the clouds above had parted ever so slightly, and through them, light filled the sky, making some to avoid. Thousands of children rest in their beds hungry. We cannot allow this to stand. President Kantorovich and the DSPR will have even more money from the bloated military budget, and you said funds kickstart nationwide food drives. So these assets from Phoenix and Sibir will also be liquidated in all order to support our endeavors, much to the dismay of arrivals in the ARPP and even the RAPP. The Hawks and Conservatives may kick and scream about defying our army, but with the Kantorovich and the power, they have no voice through us. After all, who made the corporation so powerful in the first place? The fruits of our labor. Christina was cold and tired. Miserable, filthy, greasy, she walked the streets of Kansk aimlessly. She was lost without a home, without a purpose. Often she wanted to die, but worst of all was a gnawing in her belly. 
It was difficult to describe our starvation if you haven't experienced it. It's not a concept of periodic and affects everyone differently. First, you lose control of your emotions. You swing from incredibly sadness to irrational anger without reason. Then your stomach twists itself in knots, girdling and ripping itself apart in search of food. You feel as though an is twisting in your gap. Then comes an exhaustion, physical, mental, spiritual. An exhaustion so deep you feel as though you might pass out of where you stand. Your brain numbs and your higher thoughts strangle. But worst of all is that this is not constant. It comes in waves like the tide crashing over you, filling your lungs to bursting. Then it recedes and you have time to contemplate your slow death before the symptoms come again. Christina knew this intimately. Hunger had been part of her life since she'd been thrown out of her family's home, abandoned. She scrounged through garbage or begged for just what she needed to survive. Now that she wanted to, why did she kept going through the motions of life she wasn't sure? Perhaps her lizard brain had simply seized control, forcing her to keep the disgusting apparatus of her body alive as part of some misbegotten evolutionary conspiracy, whatever the, the reason she lived. But she was alone, truly. Not, no one, not even the people who created her, gave a darn if she survived. That's why she was so surprised when a government agent stopped on, her, stopped on the street. This is me, ma'am, the young man said. Chris, you, she was just a kid. Barely 17, if she could tell. We're going through the city handing out food vouchers. You can redeem them at any grocery store. This should be enough to last you a month or so. She snatched a bundle out of the worker's hands. Yeah, and what's the angle? No, I'm going to be back next month with more. Next Generation. Alina loves school. I almost read alcohol. When she was in elementary school, uh, school was a dull place with rickety chairs where she had to learn much math, for, hard math formulas on old textbooks and paper. The teachers were mean and strict and they didn't even have food in the cafeteria. Alina remembers how many kids went hungry sitting during their 30 minutes miserably asking other children for a piece of their food. Not anymore. Now school is fun. Well, maybe not as fun as playing ball or going on a date, but school is enjoyable. Imagine going on doing either one. The teachers seemed much nicer and the rooms were tight and clean. The chairs were made of splintering wool out of metal with smooth seats and desks with little divots into place for pencils. Alina's first class was hit Russian history. While she didn't like it as much as math, it wasn't too hard to be day to reading. Sitting at her desk was Miss Petrov. She always carried a cup of coffee with her that she nursed in her hands. She was kind when you had questions, but right now she could get exasperated when people didn't answer questions. Class, I need your cooperation. Cooperation if we're going to get, learn together. I want everyone to pay attention so that whoever answers can educate the rest. Who here knows what were some problems with Bukharin's communist government and the economy? She asked for the third time. The smart kids who Miss Petrov didn't call on since she wanted others to chime in rolled their eyes. Finally, Alina nervously raised her hand and was immediately called on. She stammered, well, um, the economy was supposed to belong to the workers, right? But the government owned everything. There was no unions, no real unions, and uh, beer crafts so everyone wanted to make. Miss Petrov smiled broadly at her. That's a good answer. Let's jot that down. Workers do not control the workplaces. For example, I'm in the teachers' union. We meet to discuss the wages and benefits, and if the state treats us badly, we might go on a strike, or not work, or make sure that we have tools in the time we need to teach you all, but under Bukharin, we would have been in big trouble for doing what, uh, that without permission. Who else has an idea? The children are learning with empty bookshelves, though. The state of the schools are a questionable state of the least. The quality has remained relatively stagnant since the reunification of Russia under a banner. And with the second West Russian war and subsequent dramatic increase in military spending, the situation has only worsened. Our bookshelves are empty, and we must fill them. Funds and millions will be spent overhauling our education system. No child in the Federation will enter a school without a fair chance. Oh yeah, we lowered army expenditures. You know, they keep talking about the bloated budget, but... All we're spending is on our city spending. And we're doing okay. Even though we're taxing them, taxing the living crap out of our people, but you know, whatever. Fate of the settlers, first run of the Lenin language, nefarious parasites, global conflicts, second West Russian war, aching stomachs, plagued by rats. Dandorovich took a sip of his coffee as he skimmed the paper in front of him after several minutes. Of meticulously observing every word, he got up and began to walk into the Duma. He set up his podium, and laid out several papers, and began speaking. During his speech, he eyed several senators who all seemed to grow angry with each word spoken. And with a hunger task force, we intend to eradicate the inequality of food between urban and rural communities. There's no reason why one community should stand idly by as their superior encourages themselves. Once more, I should emphasize the importance of such a governmental body, not just to feed the people, but retain faith in the administration, not to mention all the increase in efficiency for minimizing mal malnutrition. As Kantorovich finished his speech, a member of the ARPP stood up and demanded, And where will the funding for this task force come from? Surely do not think it will appear from nowhere. Knowingly, Kantorovich stared at the bureaucrat and replied, The diaspora plans for the funds to be acquired from the already liquidated corporate assets. B before Kantorovich could finish, he was staffled by the same senator who yelled, Why not cut funds from your other social spec projects? Surely you can find a suitable amount even more from these. Amused, Kantorovich asked, Is there a reason you demand me to not use these liquidated assets? Before the senator could even speak, a member of the RIPP interjected, I believe what he means to say is that why can't we gather funds from other avenues like the multitude of new social programs in existence? As the arguments dragged on, Kantorovich grew more and more infuriated by the insistent barking from the members of the RIPP and the ARPP. Uh, trying to maneuver out of the one-sided argument, Kantorovich entered the both senators and amused, so you're arguing against helping your people? The very nature of this request is to serve the people. Do you want children to be hungry? Can you quantify the lack of educational achievement, 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 of the healthcare cause and all the other externalities caused by this austerity? Quickly, both parties quieted down as they grappled with what they were arguing against. With a slight smile, Kantorovich ended the session, a person thinking the ARPP and the RIPP for helping him to improve the le legislation, another battle won. Guardians of the Next Generation We, the DSPR, are the pioneers of the next generation. 
They will learn to appreciate the values of socialism through textbooks rather than bullets, and with their new directives put forward by Katorovich and Gregorenko through their full stomachs. The other party will have a hard time reversing our benefits should they ever have the reins again, but resistance towards our redirection of funds will have uh, received surprisingly or unsurprisingly high amounts of backlash from uh, treacherous veterans and ex-corporatists. Kantorovich is a mathematician, and the conservatives are, unknown, un, are an unknown variable that must be crossed out for the sake of our kin. <coughs> as long as we can still pass bills. You know, I don't think we really passed any bills yet, have we? Familiar and different. As Zilov sat with his face in his palms, he couldn't help but feel as though the paper below him was beginning to mock him. Despite once more being one of those talented propagandists in the Federation during the war, it felt like his skill set was simply inapplicable for such an assignment. Never before he had thought that he would have this much trouble writing and designing a children's book. Zilov had the ability to draw the most innermost feelings of a person with a few words and with some well placed imagery. His old propaganda pieces acting as a match, which ignited the spirit of patriotism and the souls of his countrymen. But a children's book with the purpose of educating while simultaneously circuiting the nature of reality was a challenge that Zilov had deeply struggled to adjust to. He started recalling that the book was supposed to teach about animals, specifically those of the Russian wilderness. Although he had failed to plan anything, Zilov gave up and simply put pen to paper, hoping that his mind would guide him as long as he went. Besides, he could get to this tomorrow if he needed. Page after page, Zilov's pen flowed. He hadn't expected much such rapid progress so suddenly, but it turned out his ability to draw an emotion was a perfect catalyst for communicating the desired message of the publishers. Within an hour, he had essentially finished the entire book with equal amount of pride and astonishment flowing through him. He smiled to get a moment to gaze through the fruits of his labor. Perhaps he thought maybe his future wouldn't be defined by the creation of material and martial matters, but instead, maybe the sword could be transformed into a paintbrush for future generations to be created with. The conflicts of the old brought the seeds of the new future. The next day, we had done everything we could do and then some, yet it seems the battles have only just begun. While well, we slayed beasts big, too big to fail, dramatically improving the daily life of our workers and youth alike, it seems that nothing uh, we can do aside from curing cancer and solving world hunger can convince our opposition that we truly mean well in our endeavors. So what if our hands have gotten a little dirty along the way, if they only knew what life would be like with Primakov in charge? We well, kind of know that. Nothing but endless corruption and greed, yet our veterans never seem to see it the way we do. Whether they accept the reality or not, democratic socialism is Russia's only viable future. The Federation has entered into a brave new age, one deprived of those who exploit and oppress, those who do not follow will be left behind for the good, it's the best they sit down for the ride. Huh. It's interesting to get more paternalism and conservatism, but fun and games. TV sound cut in and out as Yevgeny and Andrei, uh, Andrei sifted through the various channels to tune in for the respective school's hockey playoffs. It was only very recently that Russia had time to showcase such yet small yet engaging events on the live TV. I'm telling you, the Barnall Falcons are going to dominate the season. None of their performances has been so far. They always have one or two point lead uh, uh, wins every game of the season. No, the game the Crusaders are going to ma smash in the finals. They soon found the channel where their hockey game was supposed to be. Instead of the game, however, a familiar face soon appeared on their TV screens. Good evening to you all, the President Leonid Kantorovich of the Democratic Socialist Party that Russia spoke on a podium. I'm here to tell you that despite all our hardships, trials, and tribulations, the Russian people pulled through. As a speaking new generation of Russians are propelling this country forward, building bridges, enlightening the masses, as well as winning medals and trophies for the skill in sports. While there's still a gap between the rich and poor, between urban and rural communities, I have faith that Russia is in good hands. With your perseverance and fresh perspectives, perhaps you may be the one to lead Russia to greater heights in the future glory. Until then, goodbye and enjoy the game. Playing to win. It's surprising that we, being democratic socialists here, we've never really worked on poverty almost at all. If anything, we made poverty worse. So, I'm like, that seems like it's... Opposite what we want. If anything, we're doing what I want to do and like uh, get rid of this, uh, debt. That barely affected real growth, which is great. Hey, look, counting pennies is doing very well. But uh, yeah, this is usually weird. This is very weird. I I I know I shouldn't always focus on cutting down debt, but like with being a democratic socialist, you think that you'd have way higher like you know deficit and poverty would reduce. But eh, I guess whatever, man. Whatever. The next day. <coughs> Leonid Kantorovich slowly stood up from his chair, brushing the window curtains aside to observe the slowly accumulating mass of citizens outside the assembly. Down with the pacifists and down with the traitors. My family is homeless because of you. The president wants to destroy Russia's military. We will not let him. Too late. Hundreds of signs bearing a variety of similar messages waved throughout the crowded streets, parallel to the winding maze of chambers and quarters where the DSPR called their headquarters, an array of all Russian patriots clashed against a thinly held line of assembly guardsmen. They eventually dispersed to give it in time, but for now the mobs firmly stood in place, always shouting, always wanting. Gregorenko placed his hand on Kantorovich's shoulder, sitting himself next to the aging mathematician while he looked out to the crowd in anxious concern. Let's start there, huh? It's been a couple of hours since noon. I wonder how long the spirits will last for. The president turned to face his minister, eyes racked with exhaustion. I don't understand, Petro. What haven't I done for Russia that they think these traders in the ARPP will? It isn't rational. The calculations are all wrong. Gregorenko lifted a glass from the small table in between them, forcing it down in a single sip. We've been too naive, Leonid. Trying to force all this so quickly, you know a facility in his base won't disappear overnight, even with a severe manifesto and those smugglers exposed. The Falcon and his corporate students have had their tendrils in their motherland since these troubled days in Siberia. Give it time, Mr. President, that's all we can do after all. As the sun began to set across the Federation and the skies above the capital fell in silence once more, 
Lena Katurovich lifted his own glass into the air with patience. Lil saw this equation too. So, I apologize for speeding, speeding so quickly and being kind of like a little angry at the beginning of this video just because like, it was, it's, it's frustrating. It's very frustrating. Um, when you want to get things done, but you just can't. So, especially with a lack of political power. But, you know, whatever. Like I said earlier, it's just weird that we, we actually made poverty worse as the Democratic Socialist Party of Russia. But, hey, whatever. If you enjoyed the video, though, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow, and will probably be the final epilog episode of this update. Thanks for watching. Have a great uh, Democratic Socialist rest of your day.